Hey everyone, I'm Mark Sargent and this is Flat Earth Q&A emails number 118 where you send me your Flat Earth questions to msargent23 at comcast.net that's M-S-A-R-G-E-N-T 23 at comcast.net and I will do my best to answer them. Let's get right to it. This one's called New Flat Earth Fl Fun Slideshow. Hello, Mark Sargent. My first email to you, and I'm a newbie on YouTube. I've been writing and publishing a ghost book the last few years, but I actually left out my flat earth belief. One page in my book is about the year 2020. I just predicted major visual occurrence will happen and left it at that. I have been a flat earth wanderer for years and even wondered things way back in my high school days long ago. My high school days was 1985 to 1989. Yeah, pretty close to me. In 1986, I got a huge, I got in huge trouble on laughing at the space shuttle Challenger explosion. Me and a friend laughed at a teacher telling us about it. We ended up in detention. We told the principal it was fake with no one on it. He was angry, asking us why we would think that. We said, I don't know. That being said, always made me wonder what my brain is doing. I am convinced that dead people or orb ghost energies use our brains. I mean, so convinced that in modern times I became a ghost hunter. Flat Earther with NASA is BS. Wrote a book about the ghost part and now starting YouTube with my first video. I truly did it for you and the Flat Earthers. I enjoy the most. If you get a few minutes, check it out. The title is Flat Earth Fun Movie Redos for the Flat Humor in You. I basically did a slideshow on how movies would be on Flat Earth or arguing Flat Earth reality. Hope you and others enjoy my humor and beyond. Thanks for reading this. And if you lived in Arizona, you would have been a Flat Earther 30 years ago. Mountains to flat desert and crystal clear days and nights watching flat everything. If you ever are down there, let me know. I know of many places that I have traveled to often and wondered, what the hell is this globe BS? Sincerely, Brett Babbitt. Cool. Thank you, Brett. It's really awesome. This one's called Family Tickets for QE 2019. Hello, QE 2019 family. We are putting together the roster for the speakers and your guests. We have set aside two guest tickets per speaker. If you require more, please email me. Also, please provide the names and city of your guests for the badges. Thank you, Joe and Alyssa or Elisa. And uh, it, so why are you reading that, Marcus? Well, it's because the, the QE 29 conference is coming up and I will be speaking at it. So if you're going to be in the Los Angeles area around February 22nd and 23rd, stop by. It'll be a lot of fun. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to be actually be using my two free tickets. So if if that's the make it or break it thing for you, let me know. And I'll, I'll see what I can do. In fact, I will put this in my to-do pile. And we'll go from there. This one's called About a Moon Landing. Hi, Mark. My name is Tibby or TB, as you would read it in English. First off, excuse my English. I'm not into flat earth or round earth. I don't care. <laughs> really? But I think I might have another clue for you. Well, then you do care. Uh, according to Wikipedia, the distance to the moon is more than 300,000 kilometers. I don't use kilometers. Which is more than the speed of light. Well, not more than the speed of light. It's more than one second of the speed of light. But I get it. I get it. And that means that it is more than radio waves can travel in one second. That radio communication between the Earth and the Moon on the Moon landing should have had a delay of at least one second. Oh, more than that, my friend. Because it's got to go back. It's got to go two ways. But that's not the biggest point. The biggest point is, and I'll finish up the last sentence of his email in a second, is that the transmitter that the Apollo crew used wasn't near, wasn't even remotely pow powerful enough to punch through a quarter million miles of space and the Valinel and radiation belts and hit with pinpoint accuracy uh, mission control. No way, no how. You say, well, they're bouncing off satellites. It's like, not in 1968 they weren't. They weren't. Even if you could convince me of satellites. No, it was a VHF transmitter in 1969 with a, um, I think a maximum range of 50 miles. Maybe, maybe 50 miles. So how's that, how's that working? How's that working? And again, perfect. Not only was it broadcasting audio perfectly, but it was doing video at 30 frames a second, live, 30 frames a second in 1969. 
In the year 2000, I'd be lucky if I could get an image up of my screen in less than 30 seconds, right? And that was using modems, baud modems. Oh, my God. Anyway, sorry. Uh, the last thing it says, it says uh, I've looked at some videos, but I don't see any delays in their conversation. Yeah, especially the Richard Nixon conversation. Absolutely. Hopefully it's useful somehow. All the best. And that's from TV. Cool, man. Thank you. This one's called Flat Earth Question. Mark, I have a question that I haven't seen answered about the Flat Earth facts. First of all, to reach the outer ice wall in any direction, why hasn't anyone been able to find an area that is not guarded by governmental security? Uh, I don't know if I understand the question. Hasn't anyone been able to find an area that is not guarded? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it is guarded. Antarctica is a military continent, basically. Uh, it seems like it would be almost impossible to patrol this vast area without anyone getting through. Uh, no, not if you use a multinational navy. Plus, not that many people are trying to go out there. And if you're tracking boats and planes past a certain parallel, uh, you're going to see them a, a long way off. You can shift forces around. It's not like you have to have uh, border towers every uh, couple of miles or anything like that. I mean, plane, planes can do a lot for you. Is the long distance from any shore to this wall the reason no one is able to see this from the South Pacific, South Atlantic, Indian Ocean, or any other part of the ocean between land and the ice walls? Is the problem having enough fuel to reach these areas and return without major problems? Please give me the best answers you can on this subject. After looking at the Flat Earth maps, they seem to have valid questions. Everything else to be, seems to be pretty cut and dry. Thanks for your help, CJ. P.S. Your Flat Earth facts have been very enlightening. Uh, thank you, CJ. And, okay, so the, the big thing about the at least the AE map, what most people don't get into, and I try to explain it whenever I can, whenever I show people the map, is that the coastline of Antarctica, the coastline, you know, where the water meets the land or the snow or the ice is just the beginning of that continent. You still have to go in a long, long, long ways, probably several thousand miles. And by that, I mean, Admiral Byrd hit the coastline uh, in 1928 and he kept moving inland with planes and whatever else he had for 30 years. And only after 30 years in 1956, that's when he found the outer marker. So the so what I'm saying is is that the white part of Antarctica is much much thicker, but we don't include it in the maps because it makes the map look I don't know out of balance, for for lack of a better sense. You get the idea. You know I mean I suppose we should maybe make an exaggerated map, uh, for Antarctica and make it a lot lot bigger. Uh, I just this question is how how much bigger can you make it? Three thousand miles maybe thick, yeah maybe I don't know. Antarctica is an intriguing place. Thank you for that, CJ. This one's called Flatter the Jigsaw Puzzle. Hi, Mark. Love your shows. Always excited when your notifications show up. You flattened me about six months ago. What a shock when it hit. I didn't have much to say to anyone for about a week and felt very strange while realizing the magnitude of the lie. I still don't have the courage to bring it up with anyone yet. I was thinking I do enjoy jigsaw puzzles, even completed a 9,000 piece one. Wow. It might be a good icebreaker if 9,000 piece puzzle? That's, that's amazing. I didn't know you could buy those. That must be like a special order type thing. Uh, it might be a good icebreaker if I was just casually doing it. Maybe open the locked down Im imaginations of the onlookers. Onlook Do you have any idea of a company that may produce such a thing or where I might order a flat earth puzzle? It would be so much fun. I still have questions about the sun and moon, especially eclipses, but I will continue to rewatch your info. The planetarium just doesn't quite seal it for me yet. Keep up the great work. Appreciate everything you're doing. That's from Carla and in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, you know, as far as puzzles go, I'm sure I don't think there's a flat earth puzzle out there yet, but there's all sorts of custom puzzle companies out there where you just send them an image and they carve it up into puzzle pieces for you so somebody take an ae map or whatever your favorite flat earth image is and just send it to a puzzle company that's what i would recommend but thank you for that carla this one's called proof hey mark new to your channel and liked your content right off the bat thought you were very and by the way this person's using text speak so you are and you it always kills me it doesn't matter uh, thought you were very articulate and intelligent. <laughs> At the same time, I had been introduced to your other Flat Earth female friend. 
Would that be Patricia? Maybe? The confusion lies within the fact that I had seen an Eric Dubay video where he was rapping, I found to be very corny, and he was dissing you and your female redheaded beauty. Uh, that would be Patricia. In the rap video, I thought he was implying you were not flat earthers, but upon further investigating, thanks to him, that's how I got turned on to you and your friend. Why is he referencing the two of you in this cheesy video in such a negative light? Can you send me proof? Oh, I wrote this person. Can you send me proof? I guess it's how I'm supposed to ask you. One problem I have when debating with globetrotters is when they tell me that all planets in the moon are spheres, so wouldn't one lean more towards the fact that the Earth would be? I tell them the Bible states nothing about the planets, but refers to the luminaries and wandering luminaries, and that's all I get. Got anything more for me to add? Thanks for your wisdom, dedication, and patience. And yeah, if anyone, again, thinks I'm a shill or an agent or anything, I will send them a video that hopefully will convince them otherwise. So you can just email me and say, I want proof that you're not an agent. And yeah, well, yeah, I'll send it to you. This one is called New Song. Hi, Mark. Just want to send you this song. A friend of mine produced it for a rapper who is pretty well known. His name is K Rhino. And this song is really well written and would be good to add to your collection on YouTube. And it's from K Rhino, uh, Flat versus Globe. Uh, number five and I don't know did I write this guy back I don't think I did I didn't so I will add that to the flat earth music I'll put that in my to-do pile and we'll go on from there uh, this one's called flat earth is like a cast iron skillet mark please let me know what you think also are there any local Kitsap or Seattle Flat Earth meetups that you know of? Can you reach me here or on Twitter? Thank you. And that's from Richard. Uh, yeah, we've had Seattle meetups, a number of them. And Patricia's been to one and Dean Marble and Paul on the Plane and uh, other people, including me. And uh, just keep keep looking for it. Uh, in fact, the last one we did was in, uh, was in Mukilteo, I think. Mukilteo, which is north, north Seattle. So uh, hopefully you will, again, if you're ever curious about Flat Earth meetups in your area, you can do one of two things. Type in Flat Earth meetup and then your state or the closest state, you know, the states around you, and it'll, it'll list them for you. Or you can just go to my Flat Earth meetup list, which is a playlist of all the Flat Earth promos I did for all the meetups so far. There's hundreds in there. And just start looking through the list, and there's got to be something. I mean, most of them are in the United States or Canada, but there are some also in the U.K., uh, and other places. So have fun with that. This one's called The Esoteric History of Planet Earth. Mark, I'd like to speak with you uh, of the reality we inhabit. There are clues littering pop culture as to the true nature of the third dimensional construct we are quite literally imprisoned in. After 20 years of study of the occult theology, esoteric and exoteric mediums, and through hundreds and hundreds of drug-induced experiences. <laughs> yeah, that's a good lead-in. I'm going to finish this one. Uh, I have concluded we are living in some sort of massive atrium. Ooh, atrium. I like that. I'm stealing that. Uh, whether the planet is a sphere, a toroid, a massive ring, or a snow globe type of environment, it is absolutely apparent to me that we are living inside an absolute nightmare. This is Eden, and we have been trapped here by God. That is not a God. Ooh. Mm, it sounds insane, but I have much to share that you will not find anywhere else. If you are a member of the authority and intend to kill me after I've... I'm reading this for the first time, guys. And intend to kill me after I discuss my findings, please consider allowing me to enlist. I, <laughs> so, okay, let me get this straight. So... If I am part of the Illuminati, basically, uh, he would like to volunteer his services to us. Right on. Great. Uh, I am unlike the majority of the lesser children of Kern. Kern? K-H-E-R-N. And have an extremely high IQ. IQ is in quotes. The information I possess may drive you to madness. Prepare thyself. <laughs> he signs it. Max Paragon. All caps. You know what? That is one of the most one of the more entertaining emails I have gotten. I am totally writing that guy back and saying, "You know what? Give it to me. Give me all you got, baby." That's awesome. 
All right. Uh, let's see here. This was a thing, the QE 2019. Uh, hello, 2019 people. We are entering the final stretch of this thing. We have tw You have 24 hours left to promote it and the 25% discount codes. So I may ask if you go gangbusters to your followers, especially the Southern California immediate areas, ticket sales locally. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I appreciate all you're doing and continue to make this event ops awesome. Thank you, Joe and Elisa. Uh, yeah, remember QE 2019. This one's called, What Happens If You Fly a Drone in an Elevator? A Real Experiment. Greetings, Mark. This is a very interesting experiment with regard to motion inside a sealed environment. Uh, that's regards, Jeff. Yep. Uh, please excuse any typos. Got it. And yeah, again, I don't, you know, some people say that, that there's, there's no gravity at all. It's just buoyancy. I think it's a combination of the two. I, I believe in buoyancy. Absolutely. You know, you take... Uh, volleyball underneath the water pops back up there's buoyancy for you i know buoyancy exists and is there an invisible uh, invisible molecular magnetic force that pulls things down uh, which mainstream mainstream science calls gravity and uh, yeah i say yeah of course i think there is because if you're driving in a sealed container like a car flying in an airplane you can generate g-forces we also know that uh, but it, does that mean they're both exclusive, you know, or ex to each other, opposed from each other? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think I think it's kind of a mix of the two. Uh, let's see here. This one's called "I Gotta Know." Mark, this is my first time emailing you. You're very easy to listen to. Usually, I'm playing Elder Scrolls Online or Fallout Four or something while I'm listening to you. I wonder if you know how intelligent you are. Uh, I don't know. I, I, intelligence is so relative. I, honestly, for me, it's just I've absorbed so much media over the years that a whole bunch of it is stuck. And if you can connect the dots, at least with me, if you can connect the dots with a whole bunch of different forms of media, you start to pick up patterns. You can start to see patterns. It's something I've, I've, I, part of me was born with, uh, which was, I, I don't know, if, hard to, it's hard to describe, but... For me, it has been just a, wisdom comes at a price, and and it's taken a number of years. I was I was absolutely blessed with intelligence, you know, raw intelligence where I could decipher calculus at a young age and do all this other fun stuff. No, it's a different left brain right brain thing. Uh, for me, it was creative problem solving. I I was always good at coming up with a solution that n nobody else had really thought of. It's like, oh, wow, that's a different way of, you know, I always got that from people. It's like, wow, I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought of that. That's different. And, and it may not even be the best way, but it was something I, so, which was, it's always tough to play chess against me because I don't, I don't play chess like other people. My brain's like all over the place. Anyway, sorry. Um, let's see here. Uh, it's always a pleasure listening to you. You are one smart cookie. Okay. Enough about you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's, let's stop that on QA emails. 117. You said, if anyone still thinks I'm a government agent, I'll send you something. Okay. I'll bite. I think you're a government agent. Prove me wrong. Uh, but seriously, I'm curious. Please send me the info you mentioned. Uh, ODD and Eric Dubay by calling you a government agent might actually be the government agents themselves. No, I don't think so at all. Uh, Eric is just a guy who's stuck in Thailand who won't come back to the United States because he's scared. And ODD, I, he follows Eric Dubay. I mean, they're they're kind of one and the same. I mean, those two did, I wouldn't say they did a lot of damage to me, but they created a whole nother side to my character, which is... You know, people look at me, you get this impression of people and, and I get a lot of people whose first impression of me is from them. And then I, so I'm kind of starting the hole and I have to kind of climb out of it with a whole bunch of people, which is why I was like, look, I'll, I'll send you something, you know, that'll, it should prove to you that I'm not an agent. Uh, but if, again, if you still think I'm an agent, great, fantastic. And again, if you, if you already like me, if you already believe in what I'm doing, then, uh, and you still want the proof that you want to send to other people. It's like, Mark's not an agent. Watch this. Then, then yes, you know, I'll send it to you as well. I don't care. Uh, I will be sending it to, through weave transfer though. Cause it's, it's pretty big. Um, it's about a gig. So let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So calling you my government agent, accusing someone else of being an agent is a way to take suspicion off of themselves. Who knows? Nah. I came to Flat Earth Realization in 2015, like many others, I was surfing YouTube when lo and behold, on the right side of the screen was suggested a Flat Earth video. When I first saw the thumbnail, I felt an emotional reaction. Yep, me too. 
Nothing blood curdling or murderous. I almost didn't click on it. Yep, me too. <laughs> That's totally a line from Archer from Krieger. Me too. I thought, what stupid co content will be on this video? Well, after one or two minutes of the video, I was like, holy crap. How do I know the earth is a globe? I walked out of my home office with a look of stupor, headed towards my wife and teenage boys. I said something like, the earth may not be a globe. It might actually be flat. Well, somehow they did believe me. I may have taken... It may have taken them several weeks, but I relayed the flat earth arguments to my family. I had previously shared all the evidence for the fake moon landing, so my family was ready to take the next step in waking up. I love the truth. I can't wait to discover the next lie that my government, culture, society, media, etc. has brainwashed me to believe, but sadly it grieves me to see others not share a love for the truth. Like Morpheus said in The Matrix, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged, and many of them are so inert, inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. Yes, that's very, very true. The Matrix, uh, say what you want about the, the that trilogy, but there were a lot of quotable lines in it, especially the first one. The one who has given me a love for the truth is my creator. Deuteronomy 8 3 reminds me that God's words sustain me in this dark world filled with lies. The Bible is a flat earth book. I never realized that till 2015. Waking up to flat earth has been like an adrenaline shot. I read the Bible and it comes alive to me in a way I've never seen before. I'm in your debt for the role you have played in my awakening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sincerely, Sean T. And you know what? I will write him back and tell him I will send him the proof. This one's called Europe and the Moon. Mark, here we go again. Uh, and it is, I think it's the, it's from Adam out in the UK and it's a daily mail. Europe wants to mine the moon by 2025. European Space Agency reveals plan that could spark a new space race. Uh, uh, yeah, has signed up rocket maker Arian Group to develop plans. Project will examine the possibility of going to the moon before 2025 and starting to work there. Uh huh. Aim is to mine regolith. Is that even a thing on the lunar surface, which could be used to create rocket fuel? Uh huh. Uh, European Space Agency says in the longer term, resources in space may even be used on Earth. Yeah. Another space reinforcement story, probably done by a startup company. Again, the it's probably that particular thing is is probably fueled. Little play on words there by the the rocket booster company because they wanna they wanna get venture capital. Sometimes that happens. Look, fake news is a real thing. Uh, even before the whole fake news w was a term, which is corporations have been buying stories forever. Uh, if you if you ever see a story that says, oh, a study now shows that chocolate may be good for you. Or eggs may be bad for you. If you ever see a story like that, chances are there is an industry behind it that's promoting it, that hired a research team that skewed the results and then put it over, put it sent it to the AP in hopes that it could get some uh, some traction. Anyway, yeah, space reinforcement story. Not going anywhere. No one's going to the moon. Ever, ever, ever. Can't fake it. You cannot fake it nowadays. Sorry, can't. Uh, Mark, are you an agent? Hey, Mark, I heard you say on your stream that you could prove that you're not an agent. Well, prove it. Thanks. And that's from Karen. And yes, I, I do remember Karen and I sent it to her. And let's get rid of that. This one's called What's Next? Hi, Mark. Yes, a lot has happened in the past two years. I've been following your videos as much as I can, as well as the Globusters and a few other notables that I've found from other members of the Flat Earth community. I've also been trying to acquire and read as many books as I can, such as Terra Firma, Hunter Proofs, Zetetic Astronomy, and, and Cosmogony. The Greatest Lie on Earth, Bible from Heaven, Earth is a Globe, Kings Dethroned, to name a few. When we last chatted, I told you about my concerns of being vocal about the Flat Earth as a Freemason. Well, I served out the rest of my term as a Master of the Lodge and then sat very quietly for another year as past Master. 
I didn't rock the boat in the lodge, and then once I finished sitting as past master for a year, I stopped attending. I spoke to a couple of friends in the lodge, and I told them why I had stopped going, and they understood my position and reasons. Before the end of the last year, 2018, I officially demitted from the lodge and the concurrent bodies that I belong to, effectively ending my journey as a Freemason. I knew that they would never invite me to the inner circle of the 33rd degree, and it's not like I would even want to get there knowing what I do now. Uh, quick side note, um, uh, just for people that don't know, you can you can buy your way up to your 32nd degree, but the 33rd degree, you have to be shoulder tapped. You cannot ask, you cannot request anybody, you have to be chosen. They have to come to you and they have to, you know, tap you and say, hey, man, you want to be a 33rd? Uh, just, just letting you know, that's how it works. So people can't just funnel the way. I mean, they can get close, but the 33rd is a special thing. They got to look at you. It's kind of like being vetted for uh, some sort of uh, government clearance where they have to look at you and it's like, okay, can this person, it can this person be trusted? It's, and that's how it works. Uh, so, yeah. so after nine years, thousands of dollars spent and countless hours of my time and energy, I slipped out the back door without raising too many eyebrows, which I'm fine with. One of my main concerns was waiting until my job at UBC had been cemented and I was on full-time permanent, which finally happened last summer. It only took five years of being on a term-based contract before I finally got on permanently. Almost as good as getting tenure, almost. At the time, I was concerned about passing off pissing off somebody in the lodge and subsequently jeopardizing my position at work, but that isn't really a concern anymore. My boss loves talking to me about Flat Earth, which is awesome, and even though he isn't a believer, he still loves to discuss it and debate where possible. Thanks so much for everything you do in the Flat Earth community and the movement as a whole. I know that I had mentioned it before, but I'd really like to get involved somehow. I'm not sure how or where I could contribute, but I'd like to do something. I have been trying to talk to people about Flat Earth as much as possible, but generally it's all by word of mouth. I don't have a YouTube channel or any social media for that matter. I canceled everything a couple of years ago because I started getting threats from random fake accounts on Facebook, and that was enough to freak me out, mostly because of my kid. That's one of the main reasons why I'm not online anymore. I'll definitely try to make FEIC this year, probably the one in Texas as opposed to Toronto, but who knows, maybe both. I also like the idea of 2020 Cruise, so I'll keep my eyes open for details on that. But I'd also like to get more involved on the ground. Is there anything that you're doing this year that which you, you think it would uh, I could come out and pitch in for? I have some vacation days left and I'm game to go anywhere in the world. Not sure if my IT technical background could be put to any use, but at the very least, I'm willing to help out however I can. I'd also like to chat on your radio show sometime, but if you think I'd have anything of value, if, if you think I have anything of value to contribute, I'm definitely researching as much as I can and want to keep learning. So any direction you can point me would be greatly appreciated. Uh, hopefully talk to you soon. That's from Dan. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, glad you're going to be going to the conferences. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know of any special events that you should, you know, just all, you know, just go out uh, outside of the conferences. Any, any special cool things that maybe FE Core is doing or Globusters. But if I hear anything, I'll let you know. Definitely. But thank you for that. It was a, it was a nice little story of your journey and uh, uh, interest, interesting story about how you, how you got out of the, the Masonic Lodge. This one's called Further Proof That Space Suits Are BS. Hi, Mark. I'm a big fan of yours. I've been listening to your videos and shows and want to finally contribute something to the Flat Earth Movement. I am a commercial tire tech and have quite a bit of experience with pressure vessels. I looked up that atmospheric pressure at sea level is about 14 PSI. That's pounds per square inch. Uh, that is significant because as you scale up, it may surprise you to know that many large tractor tires have no more than 15 PSI in them. But if you had at least that much pressure, if not more, in a suit and no pressure on the outside, that suit would be incredibly rigid. I know you already know this, but one point I haven't heard anyone say is that even if you could bend your arms, as soon as you stopped forcing on your muscles to bend the rigid suit and relax even a little, the suit would snap back to its fully extended position. So as soon as they finished a movement, they would return to a default extended position. And how could they bend their legs uh, down um, 
uh, you squat by letting yourself drop in a contract at a controlled rate. But if your legs are, are rigid, how do you force yourself downward, especially when gravity is supposed to be one-sixth as strong? This makes no sense. To put it another way, a bicycle tire is super floppy until you put an inner tube and air in it, and then you, can, you can't really bend it anymore. I hope this helps, and I hope you read it on air. Best of wishes, George Bogus. P.S. I don't mind if you use my name. <laughs> and you write that after your name. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. It's, it's okay. Uh, yeah, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the spacesuit is why I did the, um, the, the Flat Earth Clue called The Lost Nail, which is people forget. And I'm stealing some of this from Nathan Oakley, which is because he really summarized it very, very um, quickly, which was pressure needs a container, period. Pressure needs a container. You say that over and over until it, until it sticks in your head. Meaning, if it's a hard container, like a can of hairspray or a can of paint or whatever it is, the pressure is on the inside, or a propane can, or whatever it is. The pressure is on the inside, and it presses against it, you know, and it, 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 it adds stress to that rigid container. But if it's a soft container, look, I don't know, just about any tire you can think of, or a balloon, then it presses against it until it goes rigid. That's how pressure works. And there's two things that don't seem to fall out of every, everything that's out there. There's two things that don't seem to obey that law. One is, of course, the world, which is, okay, the world doesn't have a container, but there's, there's atmospheric pressure, right? There's, there's clouds and wispy things and all sorts of gases, you know, nitrogen and oxygen and fluorocarbons and name it. There's all sorts of ozone. There's all sorts of stuff out there. So what keeps the vacuum that is outside of it, which is not just low pressure, but no pressure from ripping the atmosphere off entirely? What stops that? Nothing. Nothing stops that. And so, and science will come back and say gravity, and that's their only answer. Well, gravity is so strong it holds it down. It's like really, then, then why does every, why everything fly up? Why does hydrogen rise? Why does helium rise? Why do all these things rise up? And when they get to the upper atmosphere, they just go off into space. That's and and yet oxygen and nitrogen they don't fly off into space. Where is that? And where is the bleeding edge? Where does our atmosphere end and the vacuum of space begin? Where does it happen? Well, it's got to be gravity because we're alive. Obviously, it, something's holding it down, so it's got to be gravity. And, and that's their only answer. It's like because that's the only thing you can come up with. Not that we're living in some sort of snow globe or a pressurized container or a, a building because that would do it, right? You, you know, just like water, you know, water pressure. Where, where's the container, right? It's all in the same thing. You're all, it's in the, you're in a container. <laughs> That's what it is. And the other thing, of course, sorry, I was dragging, dragging the globe thing out. The other thing that doesn't respond to it is a spacesuit, which is a spacesuit is just a balloon. It's just a thick balloon. That's all it is. You put some air in it and then you go into an area where there's no pressure. It's, it's a big difference between uh, uh, low pressure and no pressure. When you're talking about no pressure, the stress on that suit would be amazing. That, that suit would go absolutely rigid, as tight as a drum. And we never, ever see that. In fact, we don't see astronauts in vacuum chambers ever. Not without tethers. And they just, they're just telling us, of course, the military organization, they say, oh yeah, they're in a vacuum. How do we know they're in a vacuum? There's several tests you could do to prove that. In fact, the only person I've ever seen that was put in even a sort of a semi-vacuum environment was James May from uh, Top Gear. When he was put in a G4 suit, otherwise known as a pressure suit, and he was put, and there's three little things you could you could put in a chamber to prove there was a vacuum. Simple, simple things. One is a balloon or any sort of container with a, with, with air in it uh, that would expand immediately. Uh, two is is water, regular old tap water boils in um, in a vacuum. Uh, cooks know this because as you get higher in elevation, you have to change your recipes because uh, water the water temperature boils at less and less and less temperatures until when you're finally in a perfect vacuum, uh, the water just starts boiling immediately, starts immediately start boiling off. Not because of heat, just because of the, the pressure difference. And third would be noise. Because remember, the only reason you're hearing sound, the only reason you're hearing rate me right now is because of the atmosphere. The, the sound waves are rippling through. You remember, you're just breathing in a thin version of water. You know, it's, yeah, I know it's not H2O, but it's N4O. And you, and there's been tons of tests. You take a bell, one of the most classic tests, you take a bell in a chamber and you suck the air out of it. That bell doesn't make noise anymore because there's nowhere for the sound waves to go. So 
long story short, and you're saying, oh, it's still long, is that uh, spacesuits cannot do what they what they say they do. In fact, the only time we see astronauts in spacesuits really uh, doing any sort of tests are in water, in swimming pools, which is odd because it's the exact opposite of where you should be testing that spacesuit. In water, you've got pressure that's coming in from the outside. And, and it, if it, you know, the, the water is trying to crush the suit because of the, the sheer weight of the water. Where in space, it's the opposite. The suit, all the, the air, the heavier stuff, the air inside that suit should be trying to get out. And we don't see that. Anyway, thank you for that, George. Uh, good stuff. This one's called Support. Hey, Mark, Teresa here. I'm the one who sent you the Karen Carpenter videos. I was wondering if you could put me in touch with any other Flat Earth people that, that would be close to where I live. I live in uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin, which is 20 miles southwest of downtown Milwaukee. My email is uh, Teresa, L-E-S-K-I-N-E-N at hotmail.com. And my phone number is, I'll give it to you, uh, 262 and that's totally legit because I know people in the Milwaukee area and they do have a 262 area code. It would be great to talk to other people who are in my boat. I come from the Christian side of things and I know you are not as crazy about that part. I didn't say, look, I was raised born again Christian, right? It's, but I'm not going to quote a lot of chapter and verse. You know why? Because the media doesn't talk to you as much, not nearly as much. If you start quoting chapter and verse to them, they go, oh, Bible thumper gotta know how to play the game. I used to play games for a living. But I know you know a lot of people. I thought you might be able to help or put me in touch with someone who can. Thanks, Mark. I hope all is well with you. And that's from Teresa. And I will also point her in the way of the Flat Earth meetups that are in Wisconsin. This one's called The Message, Not the Messenger. Mark, one of the hardest parts of Effie, in my opinion, is being able to listen or take on information, even from sources you don't like. Brian Lambert 33 is, although full of himself, some of what he says is very compelling. And that's from Rob, staying ahead of the curve. I Okay, I will check out Brian Lambert 33. I wish you would give me a little more details on the guy. This one's called Flat Smacking West Virginia. Mark, getting passerbys while driving with my personal billboard. And he sent me a pic. <laughs> What did he paint? I think he painted the back window of his car, uh, and it says testingtheglobe.com. Oh, yeah, the Rob Skiba website. Excellent, excellent website. So thank you for that. That's from Nathan, and I know who Nathan is. Nathan's part of my Flat Earth Warcraft guild on the Stone Mall server. Uh, if you guys are, if anyone still plays Warcraft uh, and you want to join a Flat Earth guild, I'll set you up with all sorts of fun stuff. I'm one of the... Uh, I've got more gold in that guild than just about anyone I know. And, and you're thinking, why? It's because I've been playing that game for 14 years. Once a gamer, always a gamer. Kind of like cigarettes. Only I don't smoke. This one's called SpaceX Rocket BS. Tinfoil hat wearing Rocket Musk is trolling the world. Mark, feel free to share. Thanks for your support. That's from Chad. Yep, he sent me a little video. Cool, cool, cool. This one's called Mark Sargent's new trailer for YouTube channel. Uh, oh yeah, somebody watched my new my new trailer. I, I made up a new trailer for my channel in 2019. And if you're already subbed to me, you probably didn't see it. Maybe you've got the alert. Uh, he said, um, Mark Sargent's new Flat Earth channel is absolutely awesome. Excellent job with stills and clips, including an awesome soundtrack. I was most inspired and impressed. And that's from Steve Harris. Yeah, thank you for that, Steve. And it was uh, it was fun making that thing. I was looking around a lot of different videos, and I, I grabbed a little clip of one of the finest lightning strikes I've ever seen in my life, where a lightning strike hit a tree right next to... It looked like a like a hotel lodge or like a camping lodge or something like that. And not only to just fry that tree, it blew the top probably half of it off and then that half just dropped straight down and just crushed the uh, the entryway for that house no one was around no one was hurt or anything but these two guys had a camera that was right on it and it was, it was a great great lightning strike it was a fantastic reaction to it and I used that to open it up I used the old line from if you guys remember if you're old enough to remember the old anti-drug commercials where people take an egg it's like this is your brain and then they crack it and put it in a skillet this, this is your brain on drugs any questions? It's like, yeah, yeah, I get that. But so I, I did This Is Your Brain on Flat Earth, and there was lightning strike. And then I went into um, some different little clips from Behind the Curve. 
uh, documentary, and then I finished it up with uh, a montage of stills and uh, little little movie clips set to music. Gold Star, if you listen to it, and you write me and you tell me where the music's from. I'm not going to give you any hints, because a lot of people don't know where that track's from. And I, I love that. There's certain people, they, they write music uh, that for movies. It's, a mo- it's movie music. And I really, really loved it. And uh, it, 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 I hadn't been, uh, I didn't think it was as cool as, say, like the, um, the John Williams Batman soundtrack from the very first Batman movie in the late 80s. But this was, this was way up there. It was really, really good. So thank you for that, Steve. Moving on, this one's called 747 Pilot Hosts a YouTube Channel. That's from Francis. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, Not exactly sure why he did that, and I will read you the channel name real fast. The channel name is called, he's already got 32,000 subs, and it's called 74 Gear. 74 Gear. I don't know what exactly we're, uh, we're doing with him, but that's cool, so thank you for that. This one's called uh, Mark Sargent's new trailer for YouTube channel. Apparently, I did pretty well with this one. I, I don't know if it was the music change or just... I don't, you never can tell. It's kind of like cooking or chemistry. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, just a slight variation works, but I've, I've gotten great responses for this so far. Uh, that's from Dixie Angel Langan, and she said she loved it. Thank you for that. This one's called Wanna Go on a Plane Ride. Mark, listen to this two-minute video, want to take a plane ride, and that's from Dean. Uh, but where is the video from? And it is a, oh, it's a Wolfie 6020 video, which means I'm automatically not going to listen to it because he is an anti-flat earther and he just loves to. And I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure it was the whole um, Sydney, Australia to Santiago, Chile thing where or something along those lines where people say oh no you know you can get non-stop flights from these it's like it's not the night you gotta get to clue nine before you start coming at me with that stuff and i've been hearing that for a while the reason i made clue nine was because you can't prove the latitude and longitude you can't prove the route the the coordinates drop off they have they have latitude and longitude until they get about 150 miles over the water and then they go blink and they go into estimated or approximated mode, which means we have no idea where the plane is. We get an approximate idea where the plane is, but we don't know exactly where it is. Like, really? Because you have a complete 31, 32 satellite GPS overlapping blanket system? Where's where's the coverage? It's not there. But thank you, Dean, for sending that to me. This one's called, Hey, Mark. Mark, hope you're doing well. It's my birthday today. Happy birthday to you, belated. Freezing rain, unsure if I'll be in school in seven hours or not. Honestly, it doesn't matter either way. That's the thing. What really matters anyway. My son's and my health are an, are an obvious statement. Next to that, once we truly understand, blindly, b- blindly believe, or faithfully trust in God and being part of this creation, where do we go from there? I try to open my heart and soul to be guided, but I am still lost. What is the greater good? Having knowledge but no power or voice to share it? I call that torture. I wish humanity could grasp reality and stop fearing the truth. Okay, snap out of it. Let's get things done. Be bold. Take control of our lives again and declare ourselves sovereign. Deny all governed misconceptions of being free when in reality shackled to and bolted down by lies upon lies. As believers that the globe is a lie, let's unite, take a stand and stronghold, a place where we are free to grow our food and build our shelters however we see fit for our own. I don't know how many people are listening to the Q&A cast, but hopefully record numbers. (laughs) And I'm not drinking, totally sober and overtired of surviving. I don't even know where you're at in your emails. I moved the week before Christmas and have been without home Wi-Fi. Can to sell and data rates just don't even make sense. So I'll be doing some catching up from now through Sunday. Shoot me an email if you have time to when you're going to be sharing this. I always uh, enjoy hearing my words through your interpretation. Take good care of you and your loved ones. Loved ones. Sending love and light. Um, realist truth and purpose seeker jamie 
Uh, yeah, I know. I completely understand your frustration sometimes. Look, the, the world is, is 99% conflict. And that in itself says something. If this world is 99% conflict, meaning conflict is absolutely unavoidable. It doesn't matter how rich, how powerful, how beautiful, how talented you are. You always have conflict in your life. Always. You have a 100-room mansion, you're complaining about the servants. Uh, you're a rock star with Grammys. Uh, you are complaining about the tour. Uh, there's always stuff. We seem to adjust to everything. It, we, human beings are designed to be in conflict. And I think that's because outside of this world, it's an unlimited universe. Uh, outside of this world, uh, we get to do, we get to finally realize our full 100% potential. Uh, but how can you appreciate that? Sorry, you know, I know people say, well, you're, you're talking Masonic if you're going to start talking about dualism. And it's like, yeah, you know what? Dualism does have its points. A lot of things have its points, but dualism does. And I'm a big believer that, you know, you can't appreciate hot without without cold, pain without pleasure, light without shadow. Uh, and if this world is that much conflict, there's got to be a reason for it. Everything for a reason. And I think it's perspective. There you go. Hopefully that makes you feel better, Jamie. And I will write you back and tell you that I put it in QA118. This one's called Flight Data and Our Map. Hey, Mark, today I watched Flight Data on FlightRadar.com, FlightRadar24.com, and I found it uh, flights which together formed a closed path all the way around the Earth south of the equator. The line length was about 20,000 miles to go all the way around, and the hours for each flight matched up to a typical cruising speed of 530 miles an hour. If all of the civilized continents fit inside a 20,000 mile circumference, then the civilized area of the flat earth must be inside about a 6,500 mile diameter circle based on the constant. Constant. So how then is the flight from Singapore to New York, Newark 18 hours long and 9,500 miles? You can't fly 9,500 miles in a 6,500 mile round area unless you fly in circles or something. And while flight tracking computers could be lying about the distance, the passengers certainly know how long they've been sitting in that seat and planes, planes have been limited range of safe flying speeds at uh, altitude. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's one of the tough things. Look, the AE map, there's, we know everyone in flat earth knows there's something wrong with the map. There's something wrong with the perspective of it. We don't know, especially with distances. We don't know. We, we just don't know, but, uh, and you're not confused. And that's from Jesse. Uh, you're not confused at all. It's, it's something we've been dealing with. We've been trying to, I mean, Tiger Dan, uh, apparently went insane trying to modify the AE map. There's something, maybe there's something dimensional going on. Maybe it's a speed issue. There's all a bunch of different theories involved, but we all know that the map is closer to the reality than the globe. That's what you got to hold on to. But we're still working on it. We'll get there. This one's called a must-see. Uh, yeah, yeah, the convex earth theory. Uh, that was, that's last year. And yeah, you guys can check it out. The first hour of the Convex Earth, the documentary that was shot by a South American team, it's all right. But then they start getting a little off the rails where they're talking to a Portuguese uh, uh, speaking alien, I think called Bilu, Bibu, Bilu, whatever. It gets ridiculous. The first hour though, it's not bad. I mean, it feels kind of like a like a poor man's ancient aliens, but uh, but it's not terrible. This one's called Triangulation of a Star. Mark, I've looked all over the internet. I haven't been able to find anyone who addresses the idea that on a flat Earth model, we should be able to triangulate a single star from Australia, North America, and South America. I was wondering if you could point me towards a resource that attempts to explain this idea, or am I the first to introduce the idea? It seems like a pretty easy slam dunk for either side, depending on what is observable. Although I realize that things are not always what they seem, I've included an illustration to help explain my idea. Thank you for your time. Very respectfully, Daniel. And Flat Earth should be able to triangulate a single star from... Well, no, you won't be able to triangulate anything in multiple content, continents, at least in, from what I see, because you're using because we're using multiple projections, multiple instances of the same object, meaning you're seeing the belt of Orion, I'm seeing the belt of Orion, right? And we, see, we both think we're seeing the same belt of Orion, but in uh, a multiple instanced uh, thing, you know, it's just software, uh, you're seeing different... You're using, you're seeing completely unique belts of Orion. So you're not gonna be able to, between the two of us, we're not gonna be able to triangulate it, but it's gonna come out wrong because you're not seeing, the, 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 the beauty of the whole system is that you can only be in one place at one time. So I can't be in Australia and North America at the same time. So therefore you can do just about anything you want with the display system. It's pretty genius or clever, I should say. 
This one's called Code of Credibility. Hey, Mark, Sean from Greenwood, Indiana. I just created a new t-shirt. Want to thank you for inspiring this design. I hope you dig it. I have this and many more, including lots of flat earth and anti-NASA shirts on my Etsy.com keyword, T-H-I-R-S-T shop. Oh, thirsty shop. I got it. Yeah. And uh, it's short sleeve, unisex t-shirt, science versus... Yeah, it's good. Good. Thank you for that. Go to credibility. Awesome. This one's called, it's a JP Morgan Chase. I'm going to have to check that. Apparently my, my bank account needs my personal information again, which is weird because I didn't think I even had a JP Morgan Chase uh, bank account, but who knows? This one's called NASA Spinoff Technology. Hi, Mark. Not sure if you've seen this. Somebody recently mentioned to me how NASA had contributed so much to modern technology. They have published this information themselves. Uh, interesting name, Blessings. Terry, and it's called spinoff.nasa.gov. Yeah, it's actually spinoff, NASA spinoff, NASA technology transfer program. Welcome to NASA spinoff. Whatever. Oh, the money those guys make. Uh, amazing. All right, moving on. We're going to do a few more anyway. This one's called Funny Video. Hey, Mark, I took this clip off ridiculousness. This clip is off an episode called Nerdiculousness. I think it would make a good meme. I put it on my YouTube channel to make it easier to show you. It's under a minute. Uh, channel West Coast laughs when Rob messes his line up and says one of these kids will invent space travel and Channel loses it laughing. My second clip you may have seen as I think I sent it out before, but I don't know if you're able to open the file. It was a $6 million man saying the moon isn't as far away as you think. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was interesting too. $6 million man, you know, a 70s show, and that was a line. He, I don't know who wrote that, but it was in the 70s. He goes, yeah, the moon isn't as far away as you think. It's like, really? And it was, was it because he was an astronaut in that show and he had been to the moon? So it was his perspective. It's like, oh yeah, I've been there something like that but he didn't it was the way it was worded i also wanted to say i've been following flat earth since uh, 2017 uh, uh, also was a nasa fanboy moon map on the wall watched every sci-fi show starting with space 1999 oh i love that show uh, so many science fiction shows took their stories just ripped them ripped them wholesale from space 1999 including the entire alien franchise was was ripped off of that uh um there was an episode called Dragon's Domain. That Dragon's Domain, which is one of the most terrifying science fiction shows, uh, episodes ever written, that spawned literally the entire Aliens franchise. Check it out if you get a chance. Uh, I've been to a few Star Trek and Stargate conventions. Wow, I didn't even know Stargate had conventions. And although I still love to watch old episodes, uh, like I heard Rob Skiba, they just don't quite have the same connection for me, Rob said, for uh, the fiction of it, not the possibility of reality. I started with 9-11 and the moon landings first before getting into Flat Earth. Thanks for your time. That's from Stephen Marlowe. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you for that, Stephen. This one's called No Water. Hi, Mark. I've recently watched your clues to Flat Earth, and I find myself now leaning more towards the Flat Earth. Of course, now when bringing this up to others, I get a lot of pushback. The most I hear from the pushbacks is, look at the moon, sun, and other planets. They're all round, therefore the Earth is round. Well, this got me thinking, what would the Earth look like with no water? I would venture to say it would look, wouldn't look round at all. It's crazy to me to think that if the Earth didn't have water and then water was introduced, it would take the shape of a round globe. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. If the, if the earth didn't have water and then water was introduced, it would take the shape of a round globe. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, we got to remember if the, uh, the the bigger question there is water with centrifugal force, meaning look at the equator, the ball, if you believe in the spinning ball, the ball is trying to throw the oceans off of it like Saturn's rings. And yet not only is the water still stuck to this world like glue, but there's there's no bulge. There should be no there should be no land masses at all at our equator. It should just be this giant hump of water, and we don't see that. And you say no, it's not that strong. And I was like yeah, yeah, it is. It's really really strong centrifugal force. I mean, there should be a hump of water. It should be visible. There should be very little land mass, if any, at uh, the at the at the equator, and that's not what we see. Gravity affects water, or I should say G-forces affect water very, very strongly. If you have any doubt, uh, hold a cup of coffee and then make a hard left turn in your car. Watch what happens. Happens. 
All right, uh, this one's called Survival Guide and Fly Earth Commercial. Hey, the only survival guide of this episode. Uh, Mark, here's the cough commercial. I know, that's Robitussin. Yeah, Robitussin commercial, latest one they did. Uh, you can look it up. mentions Flat Earth. I mean, that is the commercial, is Flat Earth. Uh, please send me your survival guide. Thanks, Captain Flattastic. Awesome, cool, and I did. And how many more can we do? Can we do this one? Uh, OMG, OMG, Orwellian Tactics. Mark, this article says they found the oldest Earth rock ever on the moon, claiming that a meteor hit the Earth and blew... The rock onto the moon, total cognitive dissonance techniques. This rock was from the earth because all the moon rocks are from the earth because no one went to the moon. Yep. Yep. Very, very interesting. Can we, I, I want to end on a fun one, but I don't know if we have any fun ones. This one's called the moon's observational perspective from flat earth rolling Mandela effect. Hi, Mark. You may need to watch my video on this to get a better understanding, but I'll try to put this in words as concise as possible. The moon appears to roll or rotate during the super blood wolf eclipse. The moon's pronounced crater was on the right from Columbus, Nebraska, from Tacoma, Washington. My friend showed it as being on the top. Meanwhile, the Griffith Observatory in LA, California, showed it in a different position, while in Morocco, it was yet again in a different position. However, from a static position on the Earth, like say here in Columbus, Nebraska, the moon doesn't rotate from day to day. Could you explain this from a flat Earth perspective? Yes, instancing. Unique moon perspectives. That's how I'm. That's how I'm going to throw it out there. It's how we do it in simulations. And you say, well, are you saying it's simulation? Yeah, yeah, I am saying it's simulation. But I don't start with simulations because most people don't understand them. Uh, remember, the average person. You know, we'll end on this one. The average person doesn't even understand microwave ovens. You've been using them since the 1970s, and 99% of the people don't know how they work, but they work. So we just accept it at face value. It's like, well, you just hit the power button and my popcorn, you know, and whatever. You, I can reheat all sorts of fun stuff. Um, simulations are tough to explain to people. The double slit experiment is tough to explain to people. Uh, unless you're a software developer, you're not going to get it. So I don't tell it to people most of the time. I start with like, you start with something simple, which is it, the world is flat. Then it's enclosed. You're in a building. And if it's a building, eh, then it's probably virtual. Sorry, that's just the way it works. Uh, again, this is not to, not to freak anybody out, but that's that's how it is. It, it, the Truman Show is a good, again, uh, it's just layers. It's layers and layers. How much are you willing to absorb? How much are you willing to believe? What's your threshold? And that's, you know, you, you always have to start with the lowest possible, the smallest, the easiest uh, introductory. Again, it's why all college courses have you know they start with 101 and then 201 and 301 and so on and so on you gotta you know, you, you give somebody a, a chemistry book from senior level when they when they first start university they, they don't want to do chemistry but you start with something easy you know like blowing stuff up in a in test tubes in in a lab and having fun with it they start learning anyway let's end on that one thank you guys uh for everyone that sent in their emails remember you want to send questions to me or whatever you want to ask for uh, just shoot it to msargent23 at comcast.net. That's M-S-A-R-G-E-N-T 23 at comcast.net. And until next time, guys, stay flat.